Hello, hello. Welcome. Hey, hey. Oh, we got everyone. Hi. Yes. Hello. Welcome, everyone. We are trying a new format this month. We, for those familiar with our uh, open ed series, it's been on Zoom and YouTube in the past. And because we are committed as a team to uh, education and inclusivity, but we figured maybe our community would prefer Instagram. So we're going to try it out. And uh, today we have two lovely relationship post guests and your two lovely hosts here. Miley, introduce yourself. Hey, everybody. I'm Miley from the Hashtag Open team. I'm the director of product here. Super excited to be pivoting to Instagram for this live and extra excited to be talking to Bear and Fifi tonight. Hey, guys. Hi. <laughs> Um, and I am Gabrielle, also a member of the Hashtag Open team. I am the director of social media and the lead portal developer. And today we are talking about race, fetishization, kink, and a whole bunch of other very topical things because it's Black History Month. Yeah. Um, but it's time to introduce our lovely guests, Bear and Fifi. They are relationship experts intimacy coaches and I can't wait for them to tell you all a little bit about themselves. Yes. You go first. Sure. Hi y'all. I'm Fifi. She her. Um and I alongside Bear. He him. Um, yes. That's me. We yeah. are intimacy coaches, non-traditional relationship experts. We work with individuals and couples looking to open their relationships, explore new relationship paradigms, people who are queer, uh, gender non-conforming, or trans. We work with a spectrum of people just looking to expand their erotic, intimate uh, relationship style. We also do a lot of consulting with intentional sex positive spaces. Mm -hmm. So uh, and around this topic, which is diversifying and um, making more affirming spaces for all people. Uh, someone said, appreciate y'all. We appreciate everyone who's tuning in live and anyone who's catching the replay. And if you are liking anything, if anything is really relatable, you can write it in the comments or you can um, drop a heart like thing, whatever in the chat and we love feedback. Yeah, um, if you have questions, <laughs> put your questions in the comments and we will try and get to them all. Yes. Yeah. So let's get started. Um, let's first talk about why this topic is important to, for us to talk about. Yeah. Um, I will start by saying this. I mean, like, it should be pretty obvious why it's important, but I'll elaborate, like, in, in the way, like, specific to sex positive spaces and intentional spaces that are surrounding polyamory and kink. Um, and, like, for first of all, the the fact that those spaces are already so taboo and vulnerable in the first place. Um, and then <clears throat> you're there, like you're in a space, you're black, brown, you're naked, and you're hit with like someone saying something objectifying about your race or your body. Uh, and you're already feeling vulnerable. And then you are hit with that. Mm -hmm. And then you probably want to just leave the fucking space or like never go back. So. I think that like the importance of talking about race in, in kink scenes has so much to do with like, this is already such a vulnerable space and a space where people are like trusting and want to feel safe. And if they are like hit with racist microaggressions, they're not gonna feel safe in that space. Uh -huh. Yeah, that pretty much explains. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Great answer. <laughs> Do you have any examples to share of times where you have personally felt uncomfortable or uninvited in a space? Um, yeah, absolutely. That, you could, that you're willing to share, if you're willing. For to sure. Share. I think that at first, like the the fact is, most of these spaces are white. Like they're mostly, unless they're like BIPOC centered, they're usually mostly white people because of like accessibility and what is available to white people that's not available to black and brown people and um it's already uncomfortable because i'm all right all right like no one here looks like me <laughs> uh but like comments about my hair my lips there's mostly that like oh and they think it's a compliment like oh my god your lips are so full or like i love the texture of your hair can i touch it 
um, it is, those are probably the biggest ones, like just like features or parts of my body that they think that they're allowed to compliment mm -hmm. because it's a compliment. Right. Similarly, um, and I'm privileged and I have skin color privilege. I'm racially ambiguous. So a lot of the uncomfortability, if it's not blatantly pointed out that there are things about me that are different, it's the just literally being in a majority white space um, and something that I don't feel comfortable being in all the time. So that element, even if, even if no one is blatantly saying anything, not seeing others like me, not feeling represented, not finding identification in the people at the space mm -hmm. makes me not want to be there. And I feel like like cultural fetishization happens for you a lot, like uh, yeah. exoticism of like mm -hmm. women mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and things like that. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, so how would you differentiate between like kink and fetish and like what is what is a safe way to in to navigate that racially? Yeah. Yeah, and this is like a hot topic in like within the sex positive community because of like not wanting to yuck yums and not wanting to kink shame people and mm -hmm. preference. I have a preference and uh, I like like a fetish by definition is you can't get off without it. That's like the Google definition, but it like expanding the more I like learn about fetishization is like the commodification of something like sexual arousal off of someone's like race, for example, where you have no ties to their history, to their lived experience, and you're just like commodifying like what you see in front of you or like what assumptions that you have as like a stereotype. Whereas a kink is like a preference of like an activity. Mm -hmm. Like I prefer to, you know, one of my kinks is, I don't know, like impact play, mm -hmm. right? That's like an activity that you're doing. Anyone can be involved in that who consents mm -hmm. versus like fetishization is, you know, a lot of times can also like lack consent when you're fetish okay. fetishizing someone. I cannot say that word <laughs> today. <laughs> Fetishization. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> when you're fetishizing someone, there is that like commodification component. Like, I don't know who, I'm just like totally stripping this person of their mm -hmm. personhood and like dehumanizing them. Yeah. Without their consent. Right. I'm summing them up into, yeah just parts and ways that they can please me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. As we're talking about fetishization, can you talk a little bit about racial fetishization? Oh, I can't say it either. Uh, <laughs> specifically, <laughs> racial fetishization um, specifically and what that means um, for those who maybe are not familiar with the term. So racial fetishization is finding, it's uh, like, wait, hold on. Have experience all these things I'm feeling in my we're with you. And um, when it comes to like racial fetishization, it's a fetishization of somebody's race. So basically like taking a, a, a feature, an assumption or a stereotype that you have about a person's race and just like going with that and running with it and right. also like creating an entire monolith of mm -hmm. like an entire group of people. Mm -hmm. It's based on the assumption that like all black people have this feature or act this way and all Latinx women are feisty or like it mm -hmm. is going off mm -hmm. of a blanket statement and, right. and basing that in like sexual attraction. Right, it's basically taking a racial stereotype and turning it into something that is arousing for you or anyone yeah just the commodification the summing it up uh, to a, a person just to those qualities that are ultimately stereotypes and why why isn't that a compliment because like you know when you envision someone being like oh like i love your hair like why I, like the intent behind it is often complimentary but why yeah. is it ultimately not registering that way because it's like, re it's reductive. It reduces someone yes. to the, it also like exoticizes them because usually it's never like your hair is so beautiful. It's like your hair is so wild. Or it's so exotic or it's mm -hmm. so curly. Like it's mm -hmm. pointing out the differences mm -hmm. yeah. between the two. Um, usually like, like a white person with like a black person. Mm -hmm. And it, 
is it like I said like reduces the person still to a feature based on like an assumption or a stereotype like if someone were to say like I've always wanted to be with a black trans guy I would be like do you that, do you have like a longitudinal study right. of like every black trans man who's ever existed like or are you just like reducing me to a stereotype mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right, to a question mark all right. What, um, why is it different for BIPOC people to acknowledge beauty in their racial difference versus when others try to recognize it? Uh, it goes back to the commodification component. Like, as a Black person, if I say I want to connect with other Black people because of shared experience or I see myself in them or there's, like, representation there, that's very different than seeking out someone outside of your race when you don't share that lived experience. Mm -hmm. So it is, again, like reductive, like why? Asking yourself, why are you seeking out right. someone outside of your race, like intentionally in this way? What assumptions are you making about them? Mm -hmm. uh, what thoughts are you having about them that are probably, the, the stereotypes that people seek out are also the same stereotypes that are weaponized against like black and brown bodies right and then we're being again like specific to these sex positive spaces in a different context where you're in a round table discussion about different cultures and races and it's uh everyone's consenting to there being questions about race to, for the sake of learning like this is generally not that kind of environment so if race or compliments or uh, any distinguishing and pointing out of the ways that someone is different from you based on race or ethnicity in a sex positive space context is going to be with I mean just questioning why yeah what is the intention are you are you yeah making an assumption i have so for example just last night i had someone come up to me and ask are you also puerto rican because she was also puerto rican and so it was like oh we like we share the same identity whereas if i had someone else come up to me and be like what are you mm -hmm. that that's a little yeah different. Very different. yeah a different feeling mm -hmm. that happens there. Can you just expand on that? Why, like, what specifically is the difference in someone being like, oh, you're coming up to you? Mm. And yeah, it's that in someone who shares the identity and who is looking for affinity in 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 me, like, a, and the asking, shared experience. Yeah, asking if I have the same shared lived experience as her, that's different from yeah feeling reduced to a, a person who's like some some kind of exotic thing that they're trying to pinpoint and figure out and be, and I'm if I'm asked that question what are you that's telling me that this person is objectifying me mm -hmm. and trying and already making assumptions about how I'm different and yeah. that's making me uncomfortable as opposed to someone who's approaching me asking if I share identity with them. I mean, I, I couldn't, I could have said no, right? Like I that she might've been wrong. And in that case, that would have been the end of the conversation as opposed to someone who's like, what are you? And then, I mean, first of all, I probably wouldn't answer that question, but depending on, you know, that could just go a the trajectory of a conversation that starts off that way would be based on it objectification. Yeah. <laughs> it um and and not one that would make me personally feel comfortable. I've I've had those conversations and they're awful actually. Yeah. I've had those conversations too. They're not fun. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And it's so invasive for somebody to mm -hmm. like come up and just expect you to put it out there and identify yourself and like put you on the spot like that it's invasive it's rude it's makes things uncomfortable mm -hmm. yeah it's not it's not a good look for anybody there are better ways yeah. there are other things you can say literally like if you want to are you from new york right <laughs> like are you from Brooklyn? <laughs> what brought you to this party like, right. yeah 
it right also, of all the things you could like make conversation over like let's not start with that let's not just like reduce it to race and identity right away right i mean our sort of like the emphasis that we make and we is on not making people feel other like especially once it's already obvious that they're different from everyone else <laughs> like do your if, if the goal here is inclusivity and creating a space that's affirming to all people a good way to do that is by not making them feel different and unlike you so starting off a conversation about how someone is different is that's pretty the, weird uh, yeah weird. <laughs> weird energy yeah yeah do do it about something else like and the other thing about um making compliments towards people about race and ethnicity and considering the things that they don't have control over like i the way we were born with our skin colors our hair textures like why don't you compliment the outfit i chose to wear mm -hmm. Um, something that is like deliberately just something that I, I dressed up for the party. Yes, exactly. Yeah, I compliment that. <laughs> yeah. No, for real. And I mean, I since again, a lot of people are doing this under the false impression that it that it's welcome, that it is a compliment. What do you say to someone who's like, well, I want to recognize someone's mm -hmm. racial beauty like I think this race is so beautiful I think this black person or, or this brown person is beautiful how do I recognize that without coming across fetishizing what would be your response I would tell them to tell them that they're beautiful and not make it <laughs> or like not bring, make so it simple yeah nice. it is it is I think that like it is not I think it's important for white people to know like it's not your place to um to create affirming spaces and to like reparations like oh there's so many ways that you can show appreciation of black and brown bodies um or uh and other like bipoc bodies without doing all of that right mm -hmm. like great you love black people like mutual aid like figure something out yeah. <laughs> and if you are attracted to a black or brown person or non-white person um you can also just tell them that they're attracted mm -hmm. i find you attractive mm -hmm. yeah I as soon as you make it about the race or something specific about their uh, yeah that that you find attractive that's when it gets weird what are some ways that um we can create safer celebratory um sex positive spaces that are inclusive of all of all people especially bipoc people yeah i this question is always so interesting because I also have like a thing with inclusivity and diversity. And I like to use words like affirming or celebratory or centered spaces. I think that the, the fact that diversity and inclusivity has to exist is a part of the, the problem. And like the idea of inclusivity feels like white people inviting people into their space, which still kind of goes into this like oppressive uh mm -hmm. structure or dynamic mm -hmm. and i think a lot of ways in which like sex positive spaces should really consider like sometimes bipods don't want to be around other white people when they're naked they'd rather be with like amongst each other and and feel safe like in their bodies together mm -hmm. so considering things like if you're someone who's a white like facilitator who runs a party and instead of being inclusive like renting out the space to a bipoc centered party or or um just like building a more personable like network because i think what happens is a lot of parties will like reach out to us and they want to know how to diversify the space and it's really like a lot of these spaces start with like a group of friends most of them white and then they they vet each other so everyone's white <laughs> and that it just keeps right. like and that's what the space becomes and it's really about like examining like your proximity to non-white people and like what kind of work are you doing outside of sex positive spaces and, and checking your intention of like, are you reaching out because you want to be like the most diverse party because you want people to say good things about you on Instagram? Or are you really doing like anti racist work in your personal life and carrying those principles into your fun professional? I, I don't know. What is it? Like, I mean, lifestyle? Exactly. Yeah. Yes. The, what you're curating with your community. Like, what are the principles that you adhere to? Um, and, and for it to be a truly intentional space, uh, those are questions to consider before putting on a party 
or an event or an orgy. Yeah. Um, there was a question up there that uh, was asking about what to do when you are in a position of being objectified. And that's a, uh, I mean, it's a personal, personal thing. Like for me, I usually walk away. And if it's a scenario where I have to make a decision about whether I want to go back to the space or not, or if I want to address it with someone, um, that's, totally up to the individual. Uh, I take the responsibility to have conversations with folks who are, I mean, the, the kind of way I like to participate in these intentional spaces is to get to know the people who organize it. Um, and if there is ever anything that happens to me or that I witness, I make a point to bring it up to the organizers. And that's the role that I choose to play. And, you know, there, there have been scenarios as well that I've just been in shock. And, like, I've had no response to uh, an objectifying statement. And I've just kind of, like, chuckled, like, not laughed nervously. And, you know, went and got a drink and walked away. Um, and then there's been, I've, there have been other moments, yeah, that I've reported it. And I've just talk to people about um, what happened. And then there's been times that I've just never gone back to the space at all. Yeah. So um, those are things that I've employed. Um, and those are typically your general options. And you can also reach out to someone else for support. Mm -hmm. um, if you don't want to be the one to bring it up, if you're not sure what to do um, uh, in regards to that. However, it, I, if there is a way to let someone know that that occurred in the space, it would be beneficial for the organizers to be aware that that's happening just for safety and for it to not happen to anyone else in the future. Yeah, I would, I would argue that a space should therefore have like a really open chain of communication and an open space for feedback. Okay. And having those in place in advance is like setting yourself mm -hmm. up for uh, safety. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Another thing is like the what kind of protocols do you have in place? I think a lot what happens too is like a sex positive space gets called out for something like whatever, like some kind of community gets called out for something regarding and then they start scrambling. And they're like, how can we make this right really quickly? And yeah, like running around with their chicken, like chickens with their heads cut off. And if you've had like prior been doing the work in, in terms of like creating an intentional space, mm -hmm. then you would probably have a protocol at mm -hmm. that point on like how to deal with uh, racial microaggressions and how to deal with uh, consent. You know what I mean? Like there's just- Right, well, if you have a protocol to deal with consent, then you should have, I mean, then it's, it, we need to prioritize mm -hmm. uh, racial aggressions at the same as um, consent violations and if, until organizers of these spaces do these things are going to continue to happen and there isn't going to be a protocol for it and people are going to continue to reach out to us after the aggression happened and after the complaint came in trying to put out the fire so as far as sex positive curating a sex positive space goes and ensuring that it's a, an affirming space for all people going forth with that that agenda that it's it's at the same way we'll address it in the same manner as a consent violation then that already sets up a parameter for safety for BIPOC people in this space Otherwise, yeah yeah it's like instead of being reactive like how are you proactively preparing for the yeah. inevitable situation <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah exactly yeah. how are you proactive yeah I like that how how are places finding out how places are proactively, you know, thinking ahead about the stuff. And then I think paying attention to those call outs when they do happen and seeing how businesses or sex positive places um, handle those call outs. And like you said, are they scrambling because they have no idea what to do? Are they trying to sweep it under the rug? I think like as a person who like frequents those kind of places, really kind of having your own blacklist of being like, no, I'm not going to go to these places that really like have histories where we know that they've been called out and they have poorly handled them and mm -hmm. kind of like spreading the word and like making sure that, you know, you're seeking out, you know, places that, that are being proactive and with their policies. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 
one question I have for both of you is, you know, as a dating app, I'm curious to hear um, how you guys have encountered these issues with racial fetishization and stuff like that within dating app spaces. Mm -hmm. um, I think the biggest thing is the preferences. And you see it on apps like, I like frequent uh, like apps that are like marketed towards gay men. They're really big and like spaces like that where it's like literally like, no black people or like I'm not or only black people or yeah. and um, it's pretty blatant on on dating apps like in that way where people will literally list all the things that they do and don't want and a, a lot of it they think it's preference but it's just racism um, mm -hmm. both ways whether you're seeking out or not seeking out um, and I think that like learning that preference is also a lot about like what you want to do versus like who you seek out. Um, yeah. I think there's like sexual orientation, which is like who you're attracted to in terms of like gender. Mm -hmm. But I think that people confuse or like lean on preference too hard. Like, well, I can't help it. It's just a preference. And then they list it on their dating apps. Mm -hmm. um, so it usually happens in that regard or like literally people will just like hit me up and be like, I love black guys or whatever it is mm -hmm. it's it, it's a clear indicator like if you're listing racial preferences that you're racist mm -hmm. it's just mm -hmm. <laughs> that's just right because those qualities like racial it's not the same as um <laughs> as other as other things like preferring right an act that i like to partake in with partners um, and also, it being an app, you have the ability to reject someone that you're not attracted to. So, like, so what is the point? What... <laughs> right. Why do you need to, like, put that out there? Exactly, right? And, like, just make it clear that you have, that you're racist. If, if you're listing those things on your preferences, then, um, yeah, that's a problem. Yeah. It's just not good. And like knowing that and like seeing like the app the hashtag open and the ability to kind of like certain preferences, you you guys are like able to say like you cannot use that preference. Yeah. <laughs> like that's like, Yeah, so like for a good example, like BBC is a banned hashtag. Like you just can't yeah. you can't enter it on your profile because it's just straight racial fetishization and there's no reason right. for it and it makes people uncomfortable and like you said it others people. So yeah, I think making sure that um companies like we said companies have the ability to kind of create a safer space by putting those kind of um policies and um safeguards in place and i think um yeah seeking out companies who are who are proactively doing that is really important absolutely i mean i it really what makes me happy about this is how there's more access to just ethical sex positive spaces online because you know as long as these kind of racial fetishizing categories continue to exist like in the porn world on the internet um i have little faith that they'll disappear um right. you know on the on the greater scale however companies that are emerging um just adult filmmakers, ethical adult filmmakers that are making a point of eliminating these categories mm -hmm. and being more intentional about how people talk about each other's bodies um, is like in the right direction mm -hmm. um, and it makes me hopeful. And like the internet is also, when it comes to like sex positive faces, um, a lot of people go through apps and go through, like mm -hmm. that's how you meet a lot of the people who are into the same things that you're into or like find out a party that you want to go to. And when, and it's like, it's just such an important vessel, like dating apps in general to like connect that if those spaces don't feel safe, like behind a computer or behind your phone, Seriously. then like going out in the real, like, in real time mm -hmm. it's also not gonna like aid to that right yeah setting the example wow i loved all of that um we are at the end of all of the questions that we had for you but i unless miley do you have any further questions i do not uh, well but i did want to ask uh 
where we can reach out to you again, what programming you have coming up, and anything else of note yeah. before we reach out. I feel like you're better at this. At this part. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, I, we, you can reach us at, uh, I'll put it in the chat right now, um, or in the whatever this is bearandbb.com we have a conscious intimacy workshop coming up next week it's um in person and uh there will be live streaming tickets available and we have just say yeah follow us we'll announce things as they um as they come up we'll have mm. more things coming up later at the end of the month yeah we have a masculinity workshop and offering coming as well for all men of all experiences and masculine people of all experiences to work with me <laughs> and figure and sort that shit out. So that's something that we're really <laughs> Yeah, and the like stay tuned as well for um, a QD POC polyam support group. We've been marinating okay. with that and that was a, just a great request that came through at one of our workshops and that'll also be happening in the future. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Um, we are going to be doing hashtag open ed more consistently through Instagram live while we try out this new format. So if anyone who is in the chat right now or who's catching the replay um, wants to find other episodes, they are currently on our YouTube page and then we'll be saving these as IGTV. Before. Yeah. Yeah. And if you haven't checked out the app, we're available for iOS and Android. Um, you can download us at hashtag open.com. We'd love to say hi to you in the app. Love to hear what your experience is. Swipe around and hope you meet some awesome op people in open relationships. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We're on it. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. Yes. This is dope. Bye, y'all. Bye. Bye, friends in the chat. Bye. <laughs>